past couple of winters, we've been hearing a lot about El Nino and its potential to save us from this historic drought that we've been in. Um, and in my years as a science teacher, I've heard a lot about El Nino too, and not always correct things. Uh, so I can tell you what it certainly is not. Uh, it's certainly not, uh, as Chris Farley popularized in <laughs> the winter of 97, 98, a uh, giant storm with very poor Spanish skills. Um, <laughs> it's not a monster storm coming to get California. It's not a storm factory that fires storms at California. Uh, but the question of what is El Nino is a lot more complex because it involves many different natural systems interacting together. Um, and one thing to know about El Nino is that it doesn't even really relate to California because it does occur only in the South Pacific. Um, actually in between Australia and Peru. Um, and incidentally, that's where the name El Nino comes from. It was first identified by um, early Spanish speakers in Peru, off the coast of Peru, um, and they noticed this phenomenon right around Christmas time. So it was named after the Christ child, if you were curious about that. Um, so this region in between um, Australia and, and Peru in the South Pacific, um, like I said, this is where El Nino occurs. And what happens normally, not in El Nino, what happens in a normal year is that you get this movement of the trade winds moving across the Pacific towards Australia. And because this is e the equator, that water is very warm and it pushes warm water along with those trade winds. So you essentially get this warm water that piles up uh, off the coast of Australia. And then because the atmosphere and the ocean are very intimately linked, uh, that means that we also have effects in the atmosphere. So that warm water off the coast of Australia causes warm air above it to rise and it generates thunderstorms. Um, and then you can see in the diagram that air will actually cycle back and sink down towards Peru. So this, this atmospheric circulation pattern basically intensifies the climate um, of these two regions that's already in place. Um, and actually, this circulation cell we see here is, is part of a larger circulation pattern called the Walker circulation that happens all around the equator and, and intensifies uh, or, or reinforces climate patterns around the, the equator. Uh, so that's what happens in a normal year. But in an El Nino year, this, this normal pattern is disturbed. Um, so as you can see in this diagram, in a normal year, that warm water is spread out all the way across the Pacific. And that's because those normal trade winds that push the water towards Australia are weakened. And nobody really knows why they weaken in these El Nino years. We just know that they do. Uh, so this warm water is then spread out across the Pacific, and the atmosphere responds um, by having thunderstorms in the central and the eastern Pacific near Peru, not over by Australia as they are in a normal year. So this means that Peru, which is normally very dry, gets a lot of rain uh, and is susceptible to flooding, whereas Australia, um, which is normally wetter, uh, is drier in these years and has droughts and forest fires. Um, so El Nino kind of wreaks havoc on these, these two regions. Um, so earlier I said that El Nino is not really related to California, um, but it sort of is because these patterns that are happening in the South Pacific in the atmosphere can basically trigger a set of reactions that can influence our atmosphere. And that happens not only in El Nino years, it also happens in what's called La Nina years, which you may have heard of. Um, so La Nina is kind of an intensification of the normal pattern where the trade winds are even stronger than normal, more warm water is getting pushed towards Australia, um, and you have stronger thunderstorms over Australia. So we have this kind of continuum between El Nino on the one hand and La Nina on the other hand, um, and the atmosphere and the ocean are uh, constantly oscillating between these two states. And that oscillation in the atmosphere in the South Pacific can impact California. And the question of, well, how does it impact California is answered by the jet stream. Uh, the jet stream is this high altitude river of air that moves around the northern hemisphere and brings weather off the Pacific into uh, North America. And normally, that jet stream is, is north of where we are, it's north of California. But in El Nino, these perturbations that are happening in the atmosphere in the South Pacific can basically shift that jet stream a little bit farther south so that it's aimed more at us. So any storms that develop off the Pacific can be pushed onto California. Um, so basically that means that 
we could get a lot more rain. And you can see in this map here, all across the entire southern half of the US, can, we can get more rain in El Nino years. Um, and incidentally, you can get more precipitation also up the east coast and tend to get a little bit warmer weather in the northeast. And if anybody spent the holidays out on the east coast this past year, you experienced that firsthand. Uh, so basically, El Nino is this climate phenomenon. It happens in the South Pacific. Uh, it doesn't cause storms, but it makes the storms more likely to hit California. Um, so the big question is then, can El Nino fix the drought? Um, not exactly, unfortunately. Um, and part of the reason why is that not all El Ninos are created equal. Uh, so what you can see in this diagram here is this is showing all the El Ninos um, going back many, many decades. Um, and you can see that they don't all hit that top red line there. They're not all the same strengths. Um, and really for us to see that pattern of precipitation that I just showed you, an El Nino has to fall into that category of strong or very strong. And that's really only happened a couple times. Um, in the winter of 82, 83, in the winter of 97, 98, and looks like maybe this winter also. Um, but if El Ninos don't hit that top line, if they are classified as weak or moderate, we don't see that same pattern of precipitation. And in fact, uh, some years where we were in major droughts, like the winter of 76, 77, we were actually in El Nino that year, and it didn't help at all. Um, more recently, in the winter of 06, 07, it was a very dry year. That was a weak El Nino year. So there isn't necessarily a correlation between El Nino and precipitation. Um, but um, if we happen to have a strong El Nino, then we can say it will be more likely that we'll have more precipitation. Uh, so the other thing to consider here, too, is the severity of our drought. Uh, this image was generated by the National Drought Mitigation Center um, just a couple weeks ago after multiple storms in January. And you can see that the majority of our state is still in severe uh, to exceptional drought um, over the majority of the state. So we need a lot of water to recover from this. Um, specifically, here you can see cities throughout the Bay Area how much water we actually need to recover. This is showing five-year averages for um, each of these cities, and then that's compared to how much we've actually gotten in terms of precipitation over the last five years. Uh, so we're at quite a deficit. And experts actually say that we need about two and a half to three times a normal year's worth of rainfall to get ourselves out of this drought. And so it's not impossible, but it's kind of unlikely. And we have had a wet January so far, so the question is, will the weather stay wet? Uh, but the other issue to consider here is also the snow. So even if the weather does stay wet, um, and all of it falls at, on the coast as rain, that's not really enough to get us out of the drought. Uh, because this snowpack in the Sierra basically acts as our natural water storage mechanism for the summer. We need this to get us through the summer. So we need not only to have a lot of rain, but we need it to fall in the mountains. Uh, and we need it to fall in the mountains as snow. So if the temperatures are too warm in the mountains, then it won't fall as snow and it will run off um, and not be stored for us for the winter. Uh, so we need not only a lot of rain, but we also need cold temperatures in the mountains. Um, now, if you are a skier, you are probably very happy because we are actually seeing both of those conditions right now. We're seeing a lot of precipitation falling in the Sierra and we're seeing cold temperatures so that it is falling as snow. Um, which is good news. And right now, as of earlier this week, our Sierra snowpack was at about 107% of normal, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so it is possible that our, our current El Nino uh, could break records and we could get tons of precipitation and a lot of it would fall as snow in the Sierra um, and we'd have this snowpack for the winter, but then are we really out of the woods? And I say, no, not really, and the reason why is because if you look at this graph here, this is showing the a mean temperature annually in California going all the way back to 1895. And you can see that the trend here is very unmistakable. California is getting warmer. And as California warms, that increases our likelihood of extreme drought. So we can see this current drought that we're in right now as kind of a glimpse of what future California will look like. So even if this El Nino gets us out of this drought, uh, which it may or may not, um, we still need to take steps to make sure we're prepared for a drier future in California, particularly as our state grows. 
So then what can we actually do? Um, there are a lot of things we can do as a state to help ensure that we are better prepared for future droughts than we were for this one. And one, is, one of those that has been discussed um, quite a lot recently is increasing storage capacity. We can build more reservoirs uh, that would increase our, our available water for the future by a little bit, not a lot, probably 10% or less um, increase, but that would still help. Uh, we can also make strides in conservation uh, in both urban and in agricultural settings. Um, in the urban arena, we can cut back quite a bit more than we have, and we can look to other countries like Australia as kind of a model for how to do that. Um, but most of our water in California isn't even used in urban areas. Even as our population continues to grow, most of our water will be used for agriculture. So looking at conservation strategies for agriculture can really help us uh, save water for the future, um, as can uh, better systems of monitoring how much water we have, both in surface storage and in groundwater. Um, and finally, what may be actually be our best bet going forward is we can invest more um, innovation and, and uh, financial capital into uh, water recycling. Uh, this is done around the state, but not very, very widely yet, uh, though I'm proud to say that Silicon Valley has just built uh, the Advanced Water Purification Center, which can basically create recycled water that exceeds drinking water standards. Now, it's not being used as drinking water yet, so don't worry. Um, but the, we have the potential and we have the technology to do that. And as our state continues to grow, um, I think this provides a lot of opportunity for us to ensure that this precious resource remains available for us. So, nevertheless, I'll still be hoping for more rain this winter. So thank you very much. Thank you.